So I, I didn't use all my good stuff on Classified last okay, night, Jared. I saved, I saved it for Excellent. us. And that's the, the snigger you can hear from Horny. Horny, if you want to jump in, you're more than welcome as Smartest well. Smartest man in football do, is do, not involved do anything, in your observations. Do well, I'm just glad, starting with number one, that Willy Rioli is up at the tribunal because it yep. does boggle my mind that Jordan Degoe can jump off the ground, smack someone high with his shoulder to the jaw, can cuss them, they get stretched off, and he gets three, and Willie can do a little love tap and get two. I, I, I don't get it. They're trying to argue it down to one. Uh, I hope that is the case. That would be a more just outcome than two. Toby Dan Curvis the same on Jake Lloyd. And, and as I've said a couple of times, if Nathan Murphy didn't go down like he'd been struck by Mike Tyson, I doubt Willie Rioli would have even got one. So that is observation number one. Observation number two was I did discuss this last night, and we, we've sort of touched on it, but I just want to reiterate the, the throws. Now, Adam Kingsley has just made an excellent observation with us, and his frustration is around illegal disposal. If you do not kick or handball the ball correctly, penalise the player, regardless of whether they're being tackled, whether they're trying to make an attempt, or whatever they're doing, whether there's prior opportunity. If you don't get your fist to a handball, and it is not a legal handball, penalise the player. And the same goes for if... You try and kick the ball and you miss it, penalise it for illegal disposal. I just don't think that is that hard. Observation number three, I think the risk of overpaying players on potential is manifesting itself, and it did again on the weekend. So both Ben and Max King would be two of the highest paid players in the game, and I get it. I get the reasons why, and I get the reasons you forecast forward and you look at another club that would come and pay them a lot of money to get them, but they haven't delivered on their paycheck. And that is due to clearly some durability issues and issues with their body. But Ben was, you know, bordering on non-competitive uh, on the yep. weekend, which isn't good enough. He's had a, sh- he's had a really bad. He month. Hasn't kicked a goal for five weeks, I don't think. Yep. Um, and he would be paid, I would think, somewhere between seven and eight hundred thousand dollars, which is a lot of money, and puts him in the top echelon. And just on that, he was up against Sam Taylor, who we yep. spoke about, Jared. Some players are that good. Did they have their opposition spooked before the ball's even bounced? Do you think Sam Taylor's in that category now? Um, I suspect I would hate to be playing uh, against Sam Taylor, just knowing that uh, it's almost like your role is to stop him, which is uh, scary. Just a question before you move on yeah. from Ben King. Mm. I suspect if he was a player in a big club here in Melbourne or the Crows or uh, one of the one of the not one of the expansion clubs, yes. that he'd be dropped. Yes. Do you think he should be dropped? I had So I had this written down. I said, Ben hasn't kicked a goal now for four weeks and probably needs to go back and find form in the VFL. Yeah, I agree. Unfortunately, I don't think they go back to the VFL, though. They go back to... Don't they well, go back used, to the NEFL? used to be. Although, I don't think there is a NEFL anymore. I think it's all, okay. in, the, I think it's all in the one okay. competition. It is, it is a bit confusing. But it's either that or you change his role. And you were big on the preseason. And I didn't agree yep. with you at all about playing him... Him back. I'm like, well, this guy kicked 47 in an ordinary team. Yep. He's had an ACL, and he actually came back pretty well. He he was on. He kicked 33 to yep. about five weeks ago. He's still on 33. So you either drop him back or you change his role. And they tried to do a little bit of that. He's been subbed out in Stewie Jew's last game. Mm. Get him up on the wing, or I don't know, play him back. Or Matthew Lloyd said last night on Footy Classified, he'd give him a run in the ruck, which. I don't know whether his body could handle that and and the wear and tear he'd take in the ruck, but something. Something has to give there. Uh, and just on, on Taylor, I mean, there is – I used to find it a little bit when you were tagging and back in the day when, when tagging yep. was a thing. Some players you go to and you knew you had them before the ball was even bounced. They'd drop mm. their head. There'd be a sign of, oh, no, I've got you again. But then I've got the corn. But then there'd be others like Simon Black or yep. Boomer Harvey um, or Chris Judd that didn't care that you were coming to them. They were going to work equally as hard if you yep. were on them versus if you weren't. So whoever Taylor goes to, don't be spooked before the ball's even bounced. Make him earn it. Don't let him mark the footy and work harder than you've ever worked before to try yep. and, to try and get your ball. Uh, Will Ashcroft is a big injury at Brisbane. I just yes. think they've got an automatic replacement, and I think that man is Cam Rayner. But really impressed with the way that he's building his career. But I want to see him go from 14 touches a game to 22. And yeah, I think the opportunity 100%. is there for him with Bailey out. I don't know how long he's going to be out for and Ashcroft out to go to more center bounces and impact through the midfield. And I fully believe he is capable of that and could be a wild card 
ahead of the other ones. Jared Berry could go back inside. He's been uh, he's had, hasn't had a great year no, so far. He Jared has Berry. a good final series. Has yep. a, had a flat year, and they've got they've got depth. So they've got Robertson, who's yep. not in the team, and also Lyons, who is a ready made replacement and could hold up. And finally, as we touched on with Luke Hodge, but I just want to back over this. There's some terrific options for all Australian captain this year. He mentioned Toby Green, and I would not be upset with that one little bit. And there's other names like Darcy Moore wouldn't wouldn't upset me if he was captain either. Um, Jordan Dawson's been in the running for a while. You mentioned Scott Pendlebury way early in the year, Jared, which was a good nominee. But Bontempelli likes just phenomenal what he's doing. So yep. had to just look at his resume. He's about to add a fifth All Australian and a fifth best and fairest. He's building one of the best resumes we've ever seen, and he's 27. So how, Riddle, yeah. how many how many jackets is he going? I think Dangerfield's got eight. Mm. Bonds and Pelly, you would think, at the age of 27, probably plays till 25. How many will you that get a guy dozen. he can end up with? And and that'll put him in legend status in yep. the Australian Football Hall of Fame. So they're my observations for the round. one 736 736 is the Harcourt's open line if you want to have any of yours. Well, Kane, you're the second smartest bloke in footy. After this, we've got the smartest bloke in footy. Now on Sports Day, full-on footy analysis with Daniel Hoyne. Thanks to Champion Data, the story behind the game. Well, you're going to have to be strong tonight, uh, Hoyne, after uh, Kane has just uh, held back his observations for a prelude to yours. Uh, welcome to you. I just thought it was an absolute privilege, Kane, to be in the studio uh, to hear your observations. No. I, was, uh, I was really excited no, when Jake said that you're giving them tonight. Don't so. feel like you need to pump me up, Horny, because, <laughs> the, because they're tearing me down on the uh, on the temper text for not <laughs> noticing the push in the back, which Jared is, is hot on. Well, I'm going to notice uh, the footy gods are going to uh, revisit um, Adam Kingsley's team with a uh, very controversial... Push in the back, not paid. That'll be costly. And also Port Adelaide. I think uh, you've put them in the breach too <laughs> for the, the footy and then gods. someone will clip the audio of Kingsley and myself <laughs> not worry about the push in the back. And That's that it. could happen in the finals. Is there a rule that annoys you, Horny? Is there a rule you think the AFL have slipped? What what annoys you, if anything? Will no, you just focus so on the numbers G, and the data? So G's going to laugh at this. We've spoken about this for years. I, to be honest, Kane, I don't ever notice the umpires get involved in a game in the at all. Jeez. No, I, I don't notice You're it at all. So like, when me. you when you talk about the push in the back, Kane, and you not noticing it, yeah. I I don't know. I wouldn't notice it at all. Kane, you're um, talking about a bloke whose so. first Christmas present was an abacus. <laughs> <laughs> He's been involved in I'm, numbers his whole yeah. life. I'm more worried about, did that come from a turnover? Yes. Did that come from a clearance? Yes. Did you move it okay? Did you oh. not move it okay? I'm not really worried about the free kick and, uh, and what have you, which I know it annoys you, G, but we've laughed about that for years. All right. But, um, well, let's yeah. get into what you did notice, and that was... Not wins and losses, Hoiny. Yeah, so you know, our, our job is to sort of you know really assess the big picture, you know, element of the competition and whether or not your game's in good shape longer term and whether or not it's actually got some question marks. So, you know, the wins and losses is is, is there to get you to the qualifying stage on the grid, whether or not you're going to finish you know one to eighteen and where you actually sit come finals time. But I think the bigger picture side of things is, is your game actually in, in good enough shape that should you actually finish between one to eight, are you able to actually challenge enough or are you actually just going to get bundled out straight away um, you know, because your game isn't actually in, in good enough shape? And it was a cracking round of footy on the weekend. And I think that there were three examples where the result either went one way or the other, but actually, you know, to me, mm. was sort of, you know, your game is actually a little bit concerning despite having the win, or your game has actually been elevated despite actually having the loss. Okay. So if we start with, with the two losses, and for me, Paul Adelaide's loss to Collingwood on the weekend has elevated their game yep. to me. You know, I, I, didn't, I, I wasn't too sure whether or not they had that in them um, to be able to do what they did against Collingwood, to be able to win the territory battle as convincingly as they did against Collingwood, to generate eight more shots at goal than what Collingwood did. And you know, based, on, based on accuracy alone, they should have almost won that game by five goals. Um, Port Adelaide, if they had a kick to expectation yep. and if Collingwood had a kick to expectation. So they did so much right, Port Adelaide, that I think if you're a Port supporter, you can walk away from that game going, our game is actually in reasonable shape here to take on Collingwood and to take on Brisbane and to take on Melbourne come preliminary final weekend. Geelong, I've had the slows on Geelong all you year. Have. Yeah, oh yeah, all and year. I'm and and I'm still you know and I'm still not buying and they're not you know to me they're not in in that top four um, you know sort of preliminary final discussion yet, 
But to keep Brisbane to 64 points on their home ground, which I think is the hardest trip in footy um, at the moment, along with going down to GMHBA, is, a, it, it, is something that we just haven't seen from Geelong mm. this year. That was Brisbane's poorest return for the year in terms of converting an inside 50 into a score. They've been absolutely rock solid. We talked about what they did against Melbourne last yep. week where they just tore them apart. The issue for Geelong all year has been their inability to be able to hold up behind the ball. And there's just so often they've just conceded too many easy scores. Think back to that Friday night game um, only a month ago, four weeks ago, where Sydney's first half, they simply and utterly just dismantled that mm, Geelong's, mm. Um, you, know, you know, sort of defensive 50 formation by taking 16 marks inside 50 and a half. Brisbane, with 54 entries, the most potent team in the competition, took seven marks mm. inside 50. Brisbane, the most potent team on turnover that we've seen in eight years, scored two goals. And that was with Tom. Turnover. That was with Tom Stewart in the middle in the yeah. second half. So I think Geelong lose that game. They slide down to eighth, but their game has elevated again. To if they take that defensive profile over the next five weeks, that's when they're potentially going to start to be you know, a threat in terms of could they get to a preliminary final stage. Do you think we'll see more of Stewart going into the middle and then just dropping back as almost a seventh defender? I'll be surprised. Mm. Yeah. I think if you see that, you're longer in. They're in all, all sorts. sorts. <laughs> They're in all what sorts. What did you think when you saw? I couldn't. I thought it was the least subtle message I've seen from a coach to a group of players this year. Oh, yeah, I heard you yesterday, but I couldn't agree more. Oh, with you. I mean, like, goodness. I mean, you know, to lose, you know, first possession and clearance like they did was mm. just it's, something needed to be done drastically at half time. And and hats off to Chris for trying something. Um, but I think if you're seeing Tom Stewart in a centre bounce again, you're Geelong, in trouble. Geelong are in all sorts. Yeah. And then if we just go to the winners column. Yeah, we've got audio on Chris Scott explaining that if you do want to have Kane, um, you know, throughout the year. And I think, again, hats off to Simon Goodwin and the coaches for trying to unlock a little bit of offensive power, something needed to give. What I'm now looking for over the next five weeks is can they now get this defensive balance right? You don't want to be conceding 104 and 93, 94 points like they have the last two weeks. They've been opened up defensively over the last couple of weeks like we haven't seen Melbourne opened up. But they had to. They had to transition better, didn't they? Going no, they forward. had to. They yeah. had to. So, so this is the this is the challenge as a coaching group is when you've got a concern like it was offensively, how much do you then give up defensively? Yep. So they were the hardest team in the competition this year to turn possession into a score against. Over the last couple of weeks, they've now become the sixth easiest. So the balance just isn't right there, mm. and the balance is the hardest thing to achieve in footy. And if you do achieve it, the chances of you holding up success at the end of the year is going to be um, going to be high. So the, you know, so just watching that for Melbourne over the next couple of weeks. All right, let's rip right in. Otherwise, we'll run out of time because there's so much content to get through. We'll start with your seven main talking points and the Pies and their close win. Yeah, so just having a look at Collingwood and, and you know, just you know, having a look at, at their forward half game and their territory game over the next five weeks. So, you know, so their territory numbers in the first, you know, 12, 13 weeks, um, you know, throughout this season were off the charts. They were generating 50 plus entries pretty much every single week um, in the first, you know, t- you know, 12, 13 weeks of the season. Over the last six weeks, they've only done it four out of the last six times. So, you know, to have 44 entries against Port Adelaide was their season low. The week before, they only had 45 against against the Dogs, um, yeah, which was, I think, their second lowest um, for the year as well. So, so that's just an interesting phase just to be able to mm. watch in their game and just, you know, what they're doing on both sides of the ball at the moment is going okay, but it's not as strong as it was in the first 12 weeks of the year. Their accuracy at the moment is just absolutely through the roof. Mm. So, just want to give some love, you know, to blokes like Brody Meyercheck. Josh Dacos, Ash Johnson's not playing at the moment, might come back in. His accuracy is through the roof as well. And Jamie Elliott has yeah. turned his season yeah. around yep. from an accuracy perspective. So his last five weeks, he's absolutely shooting the lights out um, You know, in terms of an accuracy component. His first 12 weeks of the year was actually well below expectation and well below where Jamie Elliott has actually been performing. So, so just a couple of little areas just to watch with Collingwood over the next couple of weeks. They're going well. I don't think they're going as well as what they were to begin with. Um, so it's just interesting to see what happens over the next five weeks. Are Collingwood a better side with Dacos in the middle or on the half-back flank? What do the numbers tell you? In the middle. In the middle. Their damage from stoppage over the last you know six weeks since he's gone into the midfield has been through the roof. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. So just a couple of little things there just to watch with Collingwood. You, you spoke about wins and losses. I, I didn't get too caught up in Richmond's win. I thought Hawthorne controlled the majority of that game. What was your thoughts on that performance? 
Yeah, I, I thought accuracy hurt. Um, well, sort of, you know, really you know, was a significant positive for um, for Hawthorne up until three quarter time, and was probably you know a large reason as to why they had you know a four, five, six goal lead, and they did so much right. Hawthorne. The interesting component for me with Richmond is that I think you know their slow starts over the last you know five or six weeks would be concerning McWalter mm. and would be concerning the um, the coaching staff there. So how long can you get away with these slow starts over the last four or five weeks? So in the first twenty minutes of matches over the last six weeks, they're minus seventy seven points on the scoreboard. Only Frio, North, and West Coast are starting slower than what Richmond are. They work their way back into the game. They get their way back into the game. Think about what they did against Hawthorne. Think about what they did against St Kilda only a couple of weeks ago. Yep. So they are so they are slow starters. And I just I, I just wonder, you know, over the next couple of weeks, if you give Melbourne a slow start on on Sunday, on you know, are, are you going to be able to peg them back like you're able to peg back St Kilda and like you're able to peg back Hawthorne? So and then it, and then it just got me thinking from a um, from a player sense over the last six weeks, who are the actual slow starters? For Richmond, mm. and when I actually dived into this, this, yeah, this is actually interesting. And Kane, you might actually mm. <laughs> see me enjoy this. So, so Tim Taranto is is actually one of the slowest starters in the competition over the last over the last six weeks in terms of um, you know, his player ratings in first quarter is actually one of the um, one of the slowest starters in the competition. The interesting one as well is Dusty. So Dusty over the last six weeks is the eighth highest rated player in the comp, but in first quarters he's the two hundred and ninety first. Rusty Dusty early. They need to get him. Do you think they need to get him in the action earlier? Well, then, I, 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 yeah, I need to have a, you know, a, a bit of a look at the vision component here. But I'm just wondering if you're mirroring the two up. Richmond, you know, starts slowly. Dusty starts slowly. He's mm. playing as you know a, as a four fifty player, and then they get him up into the mm. action when you know they're two, three, four goals behind, and then he gets going. Yeah. So I just wonder whether or not they need to look at that magnet in the mm. first you know twenty minutes of matches and actually start him at centre bounce yeah. and then release yep. Ford. Well, that's what, they, that's what Melbourne did with Pickett, which we've been calling for for a while. He didn't mm. go to centre bounce a lot, but he got the first kick of the game. And you know when you touch the footy, you feel good about yourself. And that was as good a game as he's played. Everyone's the same, regardless whether you're a three-time North Smith medalist. You want the footy in your hands. So I think it's a good pick-up. And I think that's something <laughs> Richmond could go to. And, and the same's going to apply for Petrarca at Melbourne. Like He'll yeah. start forward, but if it's not coming down and he's not involved, they'll be pretty quickly getting him on ball. I can see a column in this for you, though, Kane. Slow Taranto and Rusty Dusty, <laughs> Rusty Dusty early. But the interesting one with Pickett, Kane, as you just said, like yeah, people would be surprised that he only attended four, four. or five centre bounces. Yeah. The I think game. he started the, every quarter in the centre yeah. bounce, and that was it. And that's it. Yeah. And that's it. But it but gets but, him going. Yeah, but his impact on the match mm. was significant, yeah. Um, yeah, right across the game. So it doesn't take much, but just you know what they do with that Dusty Magnet is going to be interesting moving forward. All right, the Giants, we just spoke to their coach. Yeah, yeah, I actually found him a really interesting he interview. I, I just, I, I, don't, I don't know, I don't know him for a bar no, of soap cane, but he just comes across to me like there's just a no rubbish attitude very good with man. him and yep, just authentic. cuts through the crap. Yep. Yeah. So, and uh, yeah, so having a look at GWS, you know, on Sunday and what they're doing over the last six weeks, just got me thinking that they, they've got so much talent right across each third of the ground. But I just started jotting down some names, and, and and you could you could easily mount a case for six giants to be within the All Australian squad. So well, which is like 40, one. 40 players, forty five players, whatever mm. they might be. So Sam Taylor clearly going to be in yep. the All Australian squad. Should there be? Oh, I'm not sure if there's a minimum games um, you know requirement, but if there's not, he'd be a walk up start for that. And then you can mount a case for Jack Buckley to yep. potentially be in the squad. Um, in the midfield group, so you can mount a case for Kieran Briggs if he gets going. I'm not, again, I'm not sure if there's a minimum games amount there. But then Josh Kelly as well could be in that group. Yep. And then you look in the forward 50. Toby Green's clearly going to be a walk-up start. And then you look at what Brent Daniels is actually doing at the moment. He'd be thought, the most low-key of the lot. Uh, I think, I mean, this guy, and, and rightly so, I mean, you know, he's you know, obviously second fiddle to what Toby's doing um, at the moment. But he's... His season as a whole has mm. just been so impactful. And, you know, watching him on Sunday against Gold Coast, just his, his creativity, his ability to be able to just sort of, you know, get out of traffic and then, you know, just release Create. teammates, um, you know, from that situation. 
So they've got, yeah, so you're talking about two two players in each third of the ground. Mm. You're looking at that going, and, and all of them are, are pretty much in, you know, the prime age bracket of their careers. So this this group is just leaning, um, you know, towards having a real successful yeah. you know, tilted, not only now, but just moving forward. Interested in uh, Himmelberg in his comparison. He's been essentially been... Um, half a dozen clubs have been having a crack at him or at least three or four serious ones. What's his return like compared to Taylor? Uh, in terms of just his impact on matches? Yep. Oh, it's nowhere near what Sam Taylor's doing. But you know, but then again, there's not too many key defenders that are mm. anywhere near what Sam Taylor's doing. But I think he just plays the perfect role for... You know, to complement Buckley and Taylor yep. as well. So Buckley and Taylor, you know, they're extremely good interceptors. They're great lockdown players, but they're probably not, you know, the best ball users going around. That's where Himmelberg comes into play. So that balance between yep. um, between the three of them um, is just, you know, it's just you know, sort of hit that sweet spot for GWS. All right, let's talk about the Hawks, Horny. Yeah, so I just want to take out, so I just, you know, having that conversation with a lot of people after round two, where they got absolutely wiped off the park mm. against the Swans and, and, and belted against Essendon in round one. And and a lot of the conversation was around, you know, whether or not they're actually going to win a game or not for the season. So when you have a look at their profile post that post those first two weeks of the year, there's so many positives for Hawthorne that, you know, if you're Sam Mitchell and the Hawthorne supporters, that you can take in and you can see what they're actually trying to do moving forward. So their ball movement game is the third best in the competition. This is, you know, across mm. 17 weeks. Mm. Their contest work, which is a surprise for me. So their contest work under under Alex under Alistair Clarkson at Hawthorne had never sort of really been a strength for the last five or six years. Under Mitchell this year, they you know, they are the six, the sixth best contest team once the ball's in general play. And when the ball's on the deck, there's no one better in the competition at winning that ground ball mm. than Hawthorne since those first two games of the year. We know they take Corridor more than anyone else in the competition. We know they play on more than anyone else in the competition. But there's so much more to their game at the moment, which is just you know so exciting. Given you know you know where this age and games profile you know list is actually at at the moment. And then you have a look at our you know at our new rating system, the hundred X rating system. So based on expectation, purely based on expectation. They have four of the top 50 players in the competition with Sicily. Jai Newcomb is flying. Mm, um, really you know, well. Carl Amon's having a really good year mm. and an underrated year mm. on the wing. And Dylan Moore, again, is actually having real significant impact in the forward half um, of the ground. And the other one I just wanted to float for Hawthorne supporters is Josh Ward as well. So yeah, an early draft pick seems to have found a spot on that wing roll um, at the moment. And he's having a really good five, six, seven week period there for the Hawks. So they're doing a lot right um, at the moment. What about Weddle? Launch. Weddle's going along quite nicely, um, but sort of, you know, not in that sort of, yep. you know, you know high, higher echelon um, of the competition just yet. You've got to moment. guess who for us, Hoiny, before we go to our first little breather for the Pontus yes. to have a you got to guess who? So, guess who? This is reverted. Yeah, this is a player guess who. This is the last six-week period. Who is the third highest rated Ruckman over the last six weeks? The number one Ruckman in the competition of the last six weeks is Max Gorn. The number two Ruckman is Tim English. Who is the third highest rated Ruckman in the competition? Oh, hasn't guess who taken off? It has. Who was your guess? Uh, my guess was Luke Jackson. And what is we... Go through some of the numbers, the names on the text. Ivan Soldo from Pat, Rowan Marshall, Wits, uh, Jeremy Finlayson from Benny. I like that one. Patrick Cripps, Ned Reeves, Andrew Phillips, Kieran Briggs, but I think Briggs is, is an obvious answer, so he wouldn't have been one. Oscar McInerney, Andrew Phillips getting some love. His tap work has been good. I'm going to go with Phillips as well with Chris mm -hmm. off the temper text. A lot of uh, a lot of text, which is good, but I uh, haven't seen the the right answer oh, yet. No, 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 like. no, I haven't seen the right answer from uh, from yourself, Kane, or from <laughs> Jared. So the right answer coming Riley in as, is as the late third one? rated ruck over the last six weeks is Tom DeConing. Tom DeConing. Mm. So good this is Tom. so this, this is, is good for the contract. Well, yeah, and it's interesting from a contract sense. So you know, Pittenet hasn't played. Yep. Too much at all during this six week period, and he's he's been given full reign. Yep. Um, and the returns that he's been able to deliver now over you know over this six week period playing, you know three or four games whatever he's played has been has been strong. So his ability to be able to get involved around the ground mm. and be able to win clearance and to be able to win contest, I think is his is his standout asset. 
So, you know, only, only Gorn and Rowan Marshall over the last six weeks have had more impact in their ball winning capabilities. Um, so he's, he's flying um, at the moment. All right. Just before we get back to your observations, Jared, um, Mark Robinson is reporting on the Herald Sun that Lance Franklin had told friends four weeks ago that he was definitely retiring, but sounds as though, according to his sources, that there's been a change of heart. And I'll read this. He says, certainly Franklin would like to play again if the moons align, which really means if the swans can see a positive alignment. Should Buddy continue his career, Jared, or should, as we have expected he would, he retires at the end of the year? Well, I had this discussion with uh, Luke Hodge in your absence last night, Kane, because uh, I've thought up until two weeks ago that he was absolutely certain to retire and should retire. But the last two weeks, I uh, have seen a different Buddy Franklin. And if he can get himself and make it an absolute uh, must that he gets himself even fitter than he is at the moment, because I think he could get a fair bit mm. fitter. Um, I think it's worth having a, a strong conversation about it. And uh, I, I think Hodgie was the reverse. Hodgie basically uh, said no. Um, but, oh, gee, the last couple of weeks, he has got his overhead marking back. His pressure game is back, which is hasn't wasn't there in the first uh, 12 weeks of the season. And clearly his goal kicking and impact on the games is back. So it doesn't surprise that they're mm. toying, uh, talking about it and toying with it. So there's a long way to go in this oh, season, but uh, I wouldn't say absolutely not. You can have your say on that. The Harcourt's open line, one three hundred seven three six seven three six, 736 And the jury is deliberating on Willy Rioli trying to get that two-match ban downgraded to one. And right on cue, we're going to talk about the Swans, Horny. Yeah, so that's actually interesting now that you brought up the Lance Franklin um, Discussion. So I just wanted to take the Sydney conversation in a couple of different angles. So seeing seeing how they use Logan McDonald on Saturday night was was really interesting. So playing him more up the ground, and it looked like to me that they were using him more as that flanker type. Yep. So he was only targeted once inside 50 for the night, yet that was his highest rated game for the season. So he wins 15 disposals. He wins eight contested possessions. He only won one contested possession inside forward 50. So it was his ability to be able to get between the arcs and to be able to sort of, you know, really impact the game in that situation. I think, I think it's actually a really smart move because I think if you're looking at Buddy inside forward 50 and then especially, you know, Amadi and McLean in there, I think they're more of your target type players. Yeah. Where I think as this guy, I think his ability to be able to get involved, you know, as I said, between the arcs yep. and then use the ball going inside forward 50, I think that's going to be his strength. A recruiter I trust uh, and have always uh, thought, knew what he was talking about, said to me he wasn't a pack marking player. He's no. a ground, he's more of a ground ball running player. Yeah, and I think so often we can just look at the height and look mm. at the centimetre column and think that he's under 96 centimetres, so he has to be our inside 50. Well, I always think he, Swans are chasing a key defender. Mm. I'd love them to have a look at him before between now and the end of the year. Yeah. So Sam yeah, Edmund so. reporting that um, Tom Barras very likely to head to Sydney at the end of the year. It'd be a fantastic addition mm -hmm. for um, for the Swans. The second magnet for them was having a look at Errol Goulden playing pretty much permanently as a centre bounce midfielder yep. on um, on on Saturday night. So we've heard so often this year that you know you know that Longmire has really you know been critical of the Swans centre bounce returns. It cost them the game against um against Richmond, you know, a yep. couple of weeks ago. It has been a bit of a concern throughout the year. They throw him in as a permanent centre bounce player against Fremantle. We know Fremantle aren't going that well. But the centre bounce returns they got on Saturday night was something that we haven't seen in Sydney's game this year. To, so to score five goals from centre bounce clearance on Saturday night was a season high return. But more importantly, you know, a few of those centre bounces came at really critical stages where mm. Fremantle were actually challenging, and Fremantle would kick those two or three, you know, you know, in a row. If you think back to the start of the third quarter, where Fremantle get a bit of momentum, and then Sydney get that centre bounce goal, kills that, kills that momentum straight away. So this guy is flying as a wingman. But he's also having fantastic impact when he actually moves into the centre bounce. Which is um, interesting well. game because they've elected not to play either of their ruckmen. Last two weeks. Yeah. Yep. And uh, all of a sudden, the scores from centre bounce have gone through the roof. So yep. uh, there's always some interest around there. And Fremantle is the exact opposite. They're winning hit outs and first clearance or first possession from what I know. Nothing from it. And getting zero. And then just the other thing is just from their overall profile perspective, the Swans. So this is the last six-week period. I always love looking at a last six-week period as opposed to a four-week period just because everything just tends to smooth out. Take out the West Coast game because I know everyone will go, oh, yeah, well, they played mm. West Coast and that. So we're taking out that West Coast game. 
Their Ford 50 is functioning the fourth best of any team in the competition, and their D50 is holding up the fifth best of any team in the competition. Their ball movement game is going well. They're, they're the fifth best team in terms of moving the ball from one end of the ground to the other, and they're the second best team at, at defending the opposition going from one end of the ground to the other, and their pressure game is back to number one in mm. the competition. The only area of concern is what they're doing at, at, um, at clearance and contest. They come up against Essendon this week who are poor from a clearance and contest perspective. Mm. So if they have that profile, the Swans, against Essendon this week, they are going to be every chance to be knocking on the door at the end of um, at the end of round 20 to be just outside the eight, which is quite remarkable. Whilst you're talking about Essendon, I have a cousin who's a mad Essendon supporter. He wants to know how close they are. No, they're a fair way off, and you know we've been saying that you know for the for the majority of the season, and that's okay. You know they've still got a lot of you know a lot of youth and sort of you know unexposed youth on their list, um, if you like. And I think this year was a bit of a holding pattern yep. for Brad Scott, and we've heard him you know sort of you know really downplay expectations. But I think I think at times we got a little bit carried away in terms of what they're actually doing. For, you know you know just from a wins and losses with the W's. Go back to what I said at the start of the show. Your game will sort of you know you know sort of you know eventually level itself out and. Yeah, you know, we've seen for the last four or five years that if you're relying on playing the keepings off and defending with ball in hand, eventually that just doesn't work. And um, yeah, I think that's sort of what's happened with the Bombers over the last couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. So it'll be interesting to see if things change. Daniel Horn from Champion Data is with us as he is each and every Tuesday night. We'll take a couple of your questions shortly. You can send them through. But the APCO hot topic tonight is should Buddy Franklin go on? If you're just joining us, Mark Robinson in the Herald Sun has just written a piece saying that he is open to going on despite a month ago uh, being pretty certain that he was set to retire. So he feels rejuvenated, reinvigorated, and his body's feeling a lot better. So he's open to the possibility. Quality beverages, fresh food, grocery, essentials, and friendly service, fresh food on the go at APCO. And finally, Horny, of your observations, you want to speak about the free agents? Yeah, so it was a pretty hard game to watch your game on Sunday night, G, St Kilda and North Melbourne. But it was just two players for me that you know, was sort of really interesting just to watch their performance on Sunday night. And that was Jade Gresham and Ben Mackay. So both are available as, um, as free agents mm-hmm. this year. And just having a look at what Gresham has been able to produce, you know, sort of this year, even when he was going sort of OK in the first seven weeks of the year, based on expectation, he, you know, he was still the 120, 20th rated player in the competition. But since round eight, his form has just really dropped away. He's now the 302nd mm. rated player in the competition. So just be, just be a little bit careful if you, if, you know, if you're a club that's looking to go after him. Buy beware. Yeah, and just in terms of what you're actually getting, his ball use is is really poor for his position. So he's having the fifth least impact with ball in hand this year. So I just, you know, just trying to work out what sort of player he is and whether mm. or not he actually has that damage in his game to be worth, you know, sort of really going after in the free agency market. And last week, we just briefly touched on Kane. Um, you know, what Port Adelaide do looking after Asava Radigalia and then looking after Ben Mackay. So, you know, I find Ben Mackay a really hard one to actually mm. work out at the moment. So he, his intercept game has really improved over the last seven weeks. So no one's taken more um, intercept marks in the competition than Ben Mackay over the last seven weeks. And he's only lost one of his last, sorry, sorry, he hasn't lost one of his last 11 one-on-one contest. But outside of his intercept work, he does get exposed at oh, times. And does he's, he and yeah, so that's where, like, yeah, if you're Port Adelaide or if you're someone else looking at him, just balancing up his intercept mark work, which is a real asset. But then outside of that, what he's actually been able to do and impact the game. His timing is, is awful. He's yeah. got no sense of when to press and when to hold. And uh, he's been exposed a couple of times, to your point. And also, I don't, I don't rate his ball use at all. No. Uh, he just coughs the ball up, turns it over, and um, he's not, he doesn't compete hard enough for me. Now, maybe that's just the circumstances that he's in, but for the figure that I've heard being thrown around, there's no way you could pay him more than, say, the average wage, as I've said a couple of times. So, buyer beware, I reckon you're right on both of those players. Right, Horny, each week we talk about who the coaches missed. Uh, let's start with a big bulldog. Yeah, so Friday night's game. So Tim English, we had him as the highest rated player um, on the ground. It's actually his third highest rated game of the season. Didn't get a vote. He's really, really taken advantage of the lesser like Ruckman. Yep. Um, you know, that Essendon and Sydney have been able to throw up at him over the last two weeks. So in two weeks, 37 hitouts to advantage. Mm. Um, and, he's, and his ruck work has generated 13 scores, which is a huge number in two weeks. So No love from Bevo, though. So didn't get a vote from either coach um, on, the, um, on the weekend. Well, pretty tough to get boats off Bont and Libba and a 
couple of others. It was good, good competition, yeah. wasn't it? They had some good yeah, players. Yeah, no, it was. Um, mm. An underrated Tiger. Yeah, this bloke's actually going okay at the moment, and that's Jack Ross. So, we, you know, so we had him as the second highest rated player on the ground on the weekend against Hawthorne. Didn't get a vote, um, you know, from the coaches. Over the last couple of weeks, he's actually been the sixth highest rated wingman in the competition. So well, he, he came on against the Swans and tore them apart. It was a huge. It was actually a huge mm. substitution, wasn't mm. it? To come on when he, you know, was sort of so early in the game and have a real impact. So he's he's found his role, um, you know, sort of playing that wing role yep. alongside um, alongside Camden McIntosh under. Um, under um, um, Andrew McWalter. So he's actually going quite well at the moment and um, you know, you know, should be one for Richmond supporters to actually keep an eye on moving forward. Big fan of the next guy. He's been a big addition to Brisbane's defence. Huge, hasn't he? So Darcy Wilmot. So we had him as the fifth highest rated player on the ground on the weekend. Didn't get a vote from the coaches. <laughs> Over the last 10 weeks, so since he's really made that move down back, He's now rated as a top 20 defender in the competition. Hasn't he's, been spoken about as a rising star chance. No, he's. I, I think he might be coming from a little bit too far back when right. you're having a look at um, probably the big three in, in Sheasel, Owens and, um, and Ashcroft. But he, his ability to be able to impact the game from mm. a ball-winning perspective and then be able to use it and run and carry it and be damaging with ball in hand um, has been a significant win for Brisbane behind the ball. So he's uh, he's going along quite nicely there for Brisbane behind um, behind the footy. And your final two? Yeah, so Willie Rioli's game on the weekend didn't get a vote, and I probably understand why, but we had him as a third highest rated player on the ground. It was it was his ability to be able to impact the game through his ball use. So he had 15 disposals. And his punches. Was, his, yeah, punches or slaps, whatever you <laughs> slaps, want to refer punches. to them. <laughs> But yeah, so is the ability to be able to impact the game through his ball use. So 15 disposals was the most that he's had since round one, but he was just so creative with ball in hand, six score involvements, which was mm. the second most for any poor Adelaide player on the ground. And then just something for Gold Coast to look forward to, uh, you know, for the next five weeks was Elijah Hollands' game um, yep. against GWS. So we had him as the second highest rated player on the ground behind Sam Taylor. And, you know, he has come back into the team over the last couple of weeks. He was the second highest rated wingman for the round on the weekend. He's ball use. He's just got class, this guy. So I think he just We've got a couple be... of positives. Flanders is starting mm. to really rock and roll. Mm. Yeah. So taken at pick seven, I think he just needs time to be able to showcase why he was actually taken as such an early pick. So... Mac Andrews, the other one who I liked yeah. on the weekend. Coming along okay, isn't he? Showing some, yeah. some good signs. Yeah, so no, not is. all doom and gloom.